Um, I actually run the Beam community back in London, but I found two very kind people um, a couple of months ago that wanted to help out to launch one again here in Stockholm, which Wilhelm and I clap. Um, basically, so um, I organize in London and uh, Stockholm, and uh, we're doing a Beam Summit in Berlin very soon, and hopefully we'll get one started in uh, Paris as well. Um, I'm a software engineer um, at Arabesque. We do sustainable investing. Uh, if you want to talk about that, hit me up. Um, I'm an Apache Beam committer since uh, three or four months ago, which is super nice. I'm quite excited about it. And I'm a Google developer expert, so I build stuff on Google as well. <laughs> um, but quickly, more about Beam. Um, that's why you're here tonight, I guess. Um, so if you want to talk about Beam tonight on social media, I suggest to do it with um, hashtag Apache Beam Stockholm. And I strongly encourage everyone to sign up to uh, the mailing list. There's a dev mailing list and there's a user mailing list. You can ask all your questions there that you didn't get the chance to ask here tonight. And there's very nice people who will uh, be happy to help you. There's also uh, a Slack. Um, and we got Sharon in the audience tonight who will be able to tell you all about it and about the uh, ASF, the Apache Software Foundation, under which Beam um, is, is um, housed. Um, and we have a YouTube channel on which hopefully a recording of tonight will go up. Uh, and there's plenty of recordings from previous meetups around the world and conferences we had before. Um, and as some of you might know, uh, a few weeks ago, um, or two weeks ago, one or two weeks ago, there was a new release for Apache Beam. Um, and there's actually something quite exciting, which are cross-functional pipelines, or cross-language pipelines. So definitely do check that out. So, um, yeah, we had a London meetup for one and a half years now. Um, Stockholm is back um, and Paris is coming. But uh, most importantly, um, we're going to have the Beam Summit in Berlin uh, 19 and 20th of June. Um, so we have a website on which we'll announce the speakers probably next week. So definitely do check that out. And we have a, a Twitter handle on which we, we, we will post all the speakers you will see there. Um, I've got some good news, and I've also got some bad news, actually. Uh, the good news is that we have swag for tonight, so everybody who has good questions will get one of the Beam flashlights, and there's plenty of stickers as well. Um, if you want to be nice back, it would be cool to give some feedback. Um, we have um, a little survey where um, you can fill out like what you would like to see um, if you find it interesting or it was really boring, I don't know. Um, <laughs> basically, um, give, give us some, some uh, feedback. So uh, be meetup Stockholm feedback. That would be super nice. Uh, I want to say thanks to Wilhelm from uh, EQT and to Gleb from Spotify for making this all possible. Um, I think they uh, did a lot of work and um, it is nice for them to, to make this possible. So um, do talk to them and do say thank you. <laughs> um, but I won't keep you anymore for, um, for um, the, the actual speakers. So, Tonight we have uh, Gleb who's going to kick off and going to talk about Beam at um, Spotify and talk about um, how to use uh, SQL. After that we'll, we'll have uh, Wilhelm talk about how EQT uses Beam. And then there's the bad news. Unfortunately, Robert was not able um, to make it tonight. He cancelled very last minute. So um, what I did actually is put his slides from um, the last meetup inside the slide deck and his recording from his talk as well. And um, I already talked to him today, and we're going to make sure he uh, actually gives the presentation in one of the coming months. So I hope I didn't disappoint that much, but um, he'll, be, he'll be there um, <laughs> soon. Thank you. And um, now I will, uh, would like to give the word to Clap, who will um, kick off the first talk. Thank you. Hi, I uh, hope you hear me. Uh, yeah, my name is Gleb, I work at Spotify. I work in data infrastructure at Spotify. And this talk is about Beam SQL. And I know it's a very controversial topic, uh, like whether it actually works to use SQL in data engineering. Some people just hate SQL and they write everything in Python and Scala and they say, there is no way how anything can be done in SQL. And there is the opposite camp when people actually love SQL and they prefer uh, to use SQL for simple data engineering tasks. Um, so I, there is a place for Beam SQL at Spotify, and there are people who hate SQL as well. 
So I'm going to give an uh, introduction by starting uh, with giving a bit of a context uh, what kind of engineering organization we have at Spotify and how things work and what challenges we face. So at Spotify, we are one company uh, and we are divided in 10 different organizations, uh, six of which produce some engineering artifacts, code. And Spotify stays true to its original model that we blogged about, blocked about, about having tribes. So tribe is some group of teams that are focused on the same goal. And in these tribes, we have more than 150 teams, quotes. And we believe in autonomous teams that can execute autonomously from each other. And we believe that this setup can achieve us a good performance. Uh, overall, our organization is optimized for speed and autonomy. And we believe that's the way how we can iterate and deliver fast. Uh, I work on data platform and uh, you might heard that many things now data platform are built on top of Google Cloud. We use many Google services and services and the latest features. We use products such as storage, uh, Dataflow, Dataproc, uh, Bigtable, BigQuery, and many, many other things we use pops up. Uh, In-house, we have over 8,000 data endpoints and on a daily basis, we execute more than 600,000 tasks. It's a lot of data and managing data on such scale is uh, pretty complicated because there are many challenges just to understand how the whole system works. To address these concerns, we have built various systems internally that do uh, various tasks for data. For instance, we have systems that do orchestration of uh, data workflows. We have a concept of a data endpoint that is abstraction on top of a data set that comes with uh, metadata and basically it abstracts over type of storage we use. We have systems that are monitoring of data endpoints and alerts if there are problems with data quality or if data is late. We have lineage graphs that express how different data endpoints connect with workflows. So this way you can actually understand how your data depends on other data endpoints and make decisions about it. Or if there are some data quality problems with some data endpoints, you can see how downstream dependencies are affected. It's very useful. On top of this, we also have services for data discovery because it's very hard to communicate in such environment when you have 8,000 data endpoints and people constantly need to find data they need. Uh, Many data engineers at Spotify as well use tools that we build internally. So one of them, and the most famous one, is uh, Shiller. It's a Scala DSL for Apache Beam. So uh, data engineers at Spotify, they write their data pipelines in Scala. A lot of them, they use Scala. And analysts at Spotify, they use uh, BigQuery, for instance, to do ad hoc uh, queries and get insights. As I mentioned, our data platform has different kinds of users, and we have many different squads. Some of them are very data engineering focused. They have just, the whole team is focused on data engineering. They are professionals in Scala. They use this functional programming things, monads, monoids, and all these things. And they achieve very impressive results with it. We have teams who maintain core data sets that power the whole company pipelines. Uh, as well as we have teams doing machine learning. It is quite complicated and they write their pipelines as well in Shiva, and they use uh, TensorFlow Extended or TFX that kind of also runs on top of Apache Beam in Python. As well, we have the other side of the spectrum, teams that their main goal is not to produce data set or do data engineering, but they do some feature development. Let's say they have five people doing mobile development and three of them do iOS development and two of them do Android. Of course, data engineering is not their most strong expertise, on the same time, they really understand how their feature works, what the challenges, how they can improve it and make it better for our users. When they change the product, when they introduce change, even very small change to this feature, they always do A-B tests where they check how uh, this change affects our metrics, or often they just do experiments. And all these things, they are dependent on, dependent on data. So if you don't have data, you cannot make good decisions. On the same time, they don't have much skills doing data engineering. So what we tried many years ago is uh, having centralized functions that will solve all data engineering requests for everyone. It did not work well for us because it basically violates our principle of having autonomous uh, teams. Teams start to depend on having a central bottleneck that cannot serve everyone because every team has their own domain and it's hard for one team to understand everything. Instead, our approach is that our data platform should allow people to self-serve 
self-serve as much insights as possible. And this adoption of Google Cloud and usage of BigQuery is just exploded. Everyone right now uses BigQuery. Uh, we have found that many of our software engineers, data scientists, and many, many product owners, because most of them have technical background, at least some of them, are very familiar with SQL. And uh, during Hack Days, a group of people, some of them are in this room, have developed something called BigQ Runner. Uh, it's a small layer on top of uh, Luigi. And if you know what is, if you don't know what is Luigi, Luigi is a uh, workflow orchestration library that we have open sourced. Uh, many companies still use it and Spotify still uses it. Uh, so what BQ Runner does is basically a seen YAML DSL, uh, YAML because nowadays everything is YAML. Uh, it basically asks you to define uh, two sections. One is your query and for queries it uses uh, Jinja templates. So on this slide we have DT, okay, date time that we substitute with a partition date. And this is a batch workflow that we execute daily that you count and checks by check ID. As well as you have to specify dependencies uh, that basically our workflow engine will wait for dependencies and then we'll, it would execute this query and save results. Uh, I agree that specifying dependencies in this case is quite overkill because it's already in a query, but that's how it works. It's a great tool that we use right now. Many teams use it. It's probably the most used data engineering tool at Spotify and we'll use it for a long time. It unblocked many squads uh, at Spotify to deliver what they need because everyone knows SQL. It's very easy to use and it's pretty efficient. Uh, it has a very fast uh, test, deploy and run cycles because you can run interactive queries and you have a type check for BigQuery. So you don't need to install SBT or Maven, wait while well, dependencies are done all it's just a simple Python script. You run it, you get results very fast. Uh, and in general, it's pretty easy to understand what's happening unless people go nuts because it's all the same format. It's YAML file. You cannot do much in this. It's super constrained format, but on the uh, other side, it's pretty nice to do last mile of data engineering that people do. Uh, however, such tools comes with many constraints and in many ways, power of such tool is uh, many constraints it has, but some of them can be addressed. Uh, so for instance, Outputs and inputs can be only in BigQuery, mostly. There are federated queries in BigQuery, many of you would argue, but typically they're not as performant as BigQuery is queries that read from storage, so they're way, way less performant. Basically, at Spotify, synonym of having data became data is in BigQuery. If the data is not in BigQuery, you cannot use it because it's not in BigQuery, like what would you do with it? Uh, then there is a uh, poor support for UDFs. This again, a not bad thing to do because typically when you have UDFs in JavaScript, uh, BigQuery has UDFs in JavaScript, you can write pretty complicated things and probably SQL is not the best solution to your problem if you start writing UDFs in JavaScript. On the other side, there are a few things that are just missed in BigQuery that we would like to have, but there is no way to add them. In general, it's pretty bad integration our data platform because for instance, from the previous slide, you have to specify your dependencies manually. You would also have to write a few more YAML files to your workflow to be properly scheduled. And this kind of not really needed. And main, mainly these limitations come from the fact that we don't really understand what SQL query does. So it's kind of arbitrary text that is templated using Jinja. We cannot really parse it because there is no open source parser for BigQuery. At least there was no open source BigQuery parser for BigQuery uh, for a long time, it appeared recently. I'm going to mention it later on. And there is no, still there is no engine to run queries locally. So uh, we have a tool to do tests. It's pretty inefficient, but it works. And it's pretty painful to use. That's why people don't like to write tests while they want. As well as we found this tool can be abused to write over complicated pipelines, like thousands of lines of SQL templated by Jinja. In many ways, in some cases, uh, such pipelines can be simplified if you just had a simple data engineering abstraction, like ability to provide automatic joins, for instance, with dimensions. You can do it in Spark SQL without any problems. Uh, that's how we actually checked what else exists. There are many systems that are doing this for a long time. Hive is there since forever. Uh, many companies still use it. Spark SQL is also there, it works nice. 
it's great, very fast. Even it has generalization of SQL semantic to support streaming use cases. There is PrestoDB that is not from the higher world, it was developed in Facebook. People use it both for ad hoc queries and they use it for ETLs. It's a nice tool. Now, what started to appear is a Flink uh, that uh, has both batch and streaming SQL and it uses CalSite as a backend. And topic of this talk is a Beam SQL. So Beam also uses CalSite. Uh, what is a CalSite? CalSite is a Apache project that provides you ability to parse SQL queries and write your own compiler from your SQL to some target. You can compile standard SQL to Postgres dialect of SQL, or you can compile uh, SQL to Apache Beam pipeline, or you compile SQL to BigQuery dialect of SQL, or you compile, I don't know, SQL to Pandas notebook. And we went with Beam SQL, not a surprise. It uses CalSite, so it's what I described. And it's not a magic, it's just a simple extension to Apache Beam. Code in Apache Beam is pretty simple itself. So if you don't look into CalSite, Apache Beam code is like 20, 30 lines of Java code, 1,000 lines of Java code. And then basically what it does, it allows you to define the whole pipeline or the part of the pipeline in SQL. So you can just not use any Java, just write your whole pipeline in SQL and it would work. And as well, you can actually read data externally. So Apache Beam has many connections, connectors, you can read files from S3, from GCS, from HDFS. It supports many formats like Parquet, Avro. You can read data from PubSub, BigQuery, and so on. Because Beam SQL builds on top of Apache Beam, you can actually use all of this. It requires you a small integration that mostly is out of the box. As well as there are applicable metadata catalogs. Uh, so if we use things like Hive, or use uh, Amazon Glue, or some other products that provide similar functionality, and they have a concept of a table, you can connect them from Beam SQL. So it already supports, for instance, Hive Metastore. In our case, there are many alternatives, and you would argue why you picked Beam SQL. The most uh, selling point was that we can actually extend and fix it to adapt to our needs, uh, that we cannot do with many other things. Uh, Apache CalSite, it has a very powerful analysis capabilities. So do you remember I mentioned to you that we could not understand what uh, table depends on? Now we can do it just by analyzing CalSite SQL statement. As well as we can actually target to multiple backends. So today we can target Beam SQL, we can target BigQuery or something else. It doesn't matter for us. It's open source project, you can switch it to what you want. And as well, we have a huge investment into Apache Beam and Spotify. We have many tools. We, have, we maintain SCALD itself for Apache Beam. Many systems internally support Apache Beam and it's kind of first class support because all data engineers use Apache Beam. That's why choosing a tool that actually understands Apache Beam and is the same ecosystem as Apache Beam was a huge benefit for us. Comparing to spinning up a Presto cluster and uh, having a team that will uh, get expertise in how it works and how to scale it and so on. There are some drawbacks of it. We started to use it over the year ago. Uh, it was not as mature as many alternatives. For instance, Spark SQL or Hive is way more mature and feature complete than Beam SQL. But for us, it wasn't that much as a problem. We fixed many things in open source. So you can find lots of contributions from Spotify and Apache Beam. Uh, how it works. So you can write a simple SQL query. So for instance, in this case, we insert into a table as a select statement. That's a query our, let's say, analyst or product owner wrote. So it's not really optimal query. And you can probably see it already, but the unoptimized query plan for this, it looks like we sync uh, results into a table called stream count, and we have a aggregation function that we run in a bucket of track IDs. And then we have a filter of track ID is not now. And for those who not know, so count of track ID means that we actually count non-now values in track ID of track ID values. 
So it's kind of how SKL semantic is defined. But then actually our query optimizer will look into schema and would say that what you wrote makes no sense. I can execute this query much more efficiently because counting not now about columns is the same as counting rows as an input. And uh, you actually don't need to filter at all because there is no way how this value can become now. So that's what we get from Apache Cache side. And what Beam SKO does, it just does, takes this query plan and transforms it to a Beam pipeline. This pipeline doesn't, might not look that nice, but what it would do, it would read, for instance, from GCS, do some map function and count elements and write it back. If you think about it, there are many optimizations that are possible in SKO that either data engineers can do or cannot do uh, if they don't know about this optimization. For instance, uh, counting distinct values, you can just count elements if you know that all your input has distinct value. So say we have a data set with a column of user ID, we count distinct user IDs, but we already know in advance that all values in this data set have unique values. So we just don't need to count these things, it's pretty expensive if you do it distributed way, but we can just count elements. Or the, another example, typical mistake in data pipelines, when people do joins, they do join and then they do filter by one of the columns. In many ways, you can do optimization when you filter first and then you join, and then you reduce the amount of data you shuffle. For in Apache Beam, if you just tried Apache Beam code, it would never be able to do such optimization because for Apache Beam, all your functions are black boxes of Java bytecode. It doesn't know what it's doing inside. It doesn't really understand that you're doing a join and then filtering by something. What SKO does, it actually understands very exact, express, it has a good way to understand what you are doing actually in your pipeline. And it can do many, many optimizations. So typically, generated code by good SKO optimizer is as efficient as data engineers would do in many cases. Uh, you would ask me how it works, like how does it know about how to read data? In order to do it, it has something called external tables where you can create a table and you can point it to some, they call table provider. So table provider is a way for you to say, this table is actually not a table, but it's a table in a BigQuery. So please go and read this data set from BigQuery and here's a project data set and a table location for it. And Beam SQL comes with a bunch of providers uh, for PubSub, for BigQuery, for files, and so on. At Spotify, we already have a service that does data endpoints. So what we did, we did an extension that connects to our service that knows about all data endpoints at Spotify. And mostly it's uh, data in GCS or BigQuery. So you can write such statement and you can read any data without actually relying, is it a BigQuery or GCS or whatever. And then we can do inserts. So we can actually do the whole ETL step, extract, transform, and load in SQL. So you create another external table. It's another data endpoint, and you insert from one external table, a SQL statement that selects from another. And this way, we can do ETL. And you can write many, many lines of SQL code, and it would work. Something that doesn't exist in open source, and we, it's like a special source we introduced so we build it internally and we hope to contribute it back. Uh, it's a views. So you can create virtual data sets. So it's kind of it's the basic way for you to do composition or decomposition of your problem in smaller steps. So views, they are not materialized anywhere, but you can have a view that queries from another view, that queries from two other views, and that query from external tables. In the end, you would have graph like that. So you would have external tables, you would have views and so on, and then in the end you do insert statement. So it's a nice way to do code reuse and basic composition and decompose tasks into smaller steps. And uh, you would ask me, it's pretty complicated graph, how would I test it? Because your SKO is crazy untestable and you would uh, do many harm with it. And we have an answer for it, so we do something called data-driven tests. What it allows you to do, it allows you to mock individual steps in your big, big graph. You can either mock a view that reads data from doesn't matter what, or you can mock an external table. And you can skip indefinite amount of steps in the middle. So you can basically take a part of a big, big graph and uh, substitute some subgraph and test that inputs 
given some inputs, output matches what you expect. It's very nice and easy to write such tests. It doesn't require any data engineering skills, it just CSV files. Uh, we also have support for JSON. Uh, we don't have spreadsheet support yet, but if somebody asks, we are going to add it. Uh, something we learned in the past that we ship BQ runner as a tool. So it's kind of a small Python piece of code. We push in our internal repository. We also ship a Docker image. There are hundreds of calls that take this uh, Docker image and put in there GitHub, where they use CI CD as a service we have with Spotify. And then they each time they do migration, let's say Python 2 to Python 3 migration or upgrading Docker image version migration, they have to read the docs and do up upgrade because we don't have one repo. So it's a lot of maintenance cost and sometimes things break. And uh, it's kind of not good to distribute this maintenance cost to hundreds of quotes that just want to do a simple data engineering tasks. So the different model to approach this problem would be to have one code that will take all the maintenance pain uh, that, and maintain one single GitHub repo with all infrastructure and other teams just try to SQL. So maintenance cost is real, we learned it. Even BigQuery is managed service, you don't, BigQuery, you don't care about BigQuery engine, but still you have to upgrade all these YAML files. It's very hard to break syntax if you want to improve something. Having one repo and one team responsible for everything and other just creating a directories there, it's much better approach. So our service model is basically having a centralized repository where we store SQL and there is directories with code owners. So GitHub, recent versions of GitHub support something code owners. You can basically add your group to owner as a directory and then you get automatic reviews. We also build some static analysis tools that check code style and many, many other things. And you get an approval that ready to ship. And you just merge it. It's close to zero maintenance cost for our users. Uh, what it does, it basically, you, it asks you to say which project to run the job. If you own this project, it will approve your pull request and it will run data flow jobs for Beam SQL in your project. Uh, something we are very proud of and we spend a lot of time on is actually integration with our experimentation platform. Uh, so having a just SQL, we found that many teams uh, follow the same patterns to do simple things for experimentation. For A-B tests, they do some descriptive statistics to compute, like let's say standard deviation and average value and count of observations for each metric in order to understand if there's statistically significant change in some group or some metric. It's a lot of work, then you have to join it with 10 other dimensions. It's, if you type it with SQL, it's a lot of stuff. So what we did, we uh, did a tool that basically allows you to very easily configure what you want to join with. Uh, we, it's not a tool, it's a configuration file and what uh, statistics you want to collect. And we just do it as a part of a BIM step. So you do SQL and then you do transforms and just the segregation and compute all correlations and statistics for our experiments. And we also have a sync, like we have a special storage that can serve hundreds of requests per second with sub second latency, where you can store only these observations from experiment. So our experimentation platform UI can actually query it and get thousands of metrics in a couple of seconds. Uh, benefits. Approaching problem with SQL actually allows to extract many things such as lineage and uh, for instance, not even lineage between data sets, but even column based lineage. So you can understand which columns are used to produce, produce which columns. So and if something is unused, you can safely say, nobody ever uses this column, you can delete it and save data. Uh, query optimizer we have can actually benefit a lot of from metadata. So if tomorrow we would annotate some data set as having column as a nick, and we would inform our query optimizer about it, it would optimize it if possible. Is it working? Okay. Uh, as well as uh, you can imagine lots of repetition in typical data science or like inside workflow where you have the same material SVU 
implicitly used multiple times. What we can do, given a materialized view, we can automatically rewrite queries against materialized views, not to waste resources that are, or not to waste uh, computing power to compute something that already exists, for instance. As well as as a team, we can actually right now, we can have a big overview of what uh, our users do, and it can actually prioritize different optimizations to Apache Beam or to the way we do SQL engine. One of such examples we realize, and it's not a surprise that lots of power is spent on shuffle. So shuffle, you do basically distributed uh, shuffling of data between workers when you do MapReduce style of computation. And you, often you do this when you have any joins. And in analytics, it's very common to use joins because you have dimensional tables and you have fact tables and you join them. So there is an approach that is pretty old called sort much bucket joins that can allow you to pre-sort your data in the buckets and not to shuffle data basically because it's already shuffled as it's stored in a distributed file system. So we realize that by introducing this optimization, you can dramatically reduce the amount of joins we do because mostly people join by all the same columns. Uh, that can save us a lot of money by just having understanding that most of queries join by the same column as well as we don't have any upgrades cost anymore. We always run the latest Apache Beam version. Sometimes we even run our own build because we push something to master uh, some fix for some problem we have in SQL. And our users had some problem. I would recommend you to read this book if you haven't checked it out. A lot of things I mentioned are very boring and already described in this book. It's from 1996. Uh, it's still actual and you can learn a lot if you didn't read it. Uh, it's, it might be a bit not up to date at some points, but if you have a bit of imagination, you can translate what's written in this book to the modern big data world. Just read the first 100 pages of this book. As a conclusion, SQL, in my opinion, is a good language for solving simple last mile data problems for domain experts. But a lot of benefits of using SQL comes from its constraints. So there are many constraints of SQL as well. BigQuery is great, we like it, but it misses analysis capabilities that would hopefully address in something called Zeta SQL that was open sourced by Google recently. And Beam SQL can be used for you, uh, with your team or by your team to give access to certain Beam features. So for instance, uh, we just shipped a bunch of P transforms in Beam and gave them a SQL interface. And now people can do experimentation very easily without writing lots of SQL code. Apache Cal site is great. And uh, actually it allows you to have your SQL in a way you can understand what it does and it allows you to translate different backends. So if tomorrow there is a brand new database that is better than everything else that exists today in market, this database is written in Rust, uh, we can take our SQL and just run it on this database. We just use Calcite to translate uh, our SQL to some other SQL dialect. SQL can be a good language for different data tasks. If you're a data engineer, you like Scala, you can use it in Shio starting from 0 0.8, as it is not released yet and we are hiring. So I work in a team that does all this fancy stuff is query optimizations and query rewrites. We are in Stockholm. Uh, we have headcounts or uh, head op uh, positions. So please follow this link to apply. If you don't want to follow this link, you can visit our Spotify website and all write us email. And I'm happy to answer questions. I have a microphone. You have to unmute microphone. Mm -hmm. Questions? Ah. No? Okay. <laughs> um, hello. Uh, the, the example you showed was like uh, a batch processing problem you solve with SQL? Have you worked with uh, Beam SQL for streams? And if so, what are the particular challenges there? Beam SQL supports streaming. Uh, we don't use it at the moment. 
but everything we define, it doesn't really define, doesn't really depend on which storage you use. So if tomorrow there is a streaming use case we want to solve in our system, we can do streaming. And yes, the difference that Beam SQL supports streaming and BigQuery doesn't support streaming. I'll get you a flashlight for that. <laughs> I, <clears throat> Any other questions? <laughs> I was uh, curious how many, <clears throat> if I'm a user and I want to use the Beam SQL, uh, how many iterations, tries does it take for me to actually, you know, get my data that I intended to? Like how many fails do I have to go through? You, you mentioned you have an experimentation uh, kind of layer platform. Do you get my question? I do not really, so the question was how many iterations would you take? For yeah, that? so I mean, I'm a developer sitting with Postgres every day and I still can't write a, like a proper SQL query without, mm -hmm. you know, maybe on the fifth try I get it right. So how, how is that experience for your users? So for instance, in a case of BigQuery Runner, you'll just put your SQL inside BigQuery and you'll get result in a minute. With Beam SQL, we don't really do translation to BigQuery yet. But the idea basically given the data is in BigQuery, we can execute it on any backend if you want, and then you'll get your results fast. What we ask our users right now is just to write tests, and it's kind of very interactive feedback. Cool. Yeah. I'll just go. Let's go with the you mentioned uh, Apache Beam 2.12 supporting multi language. Uh -huh. Pipelines. Have you tried Beam SQL in a multi-language pipeline? Uh, not yet. Uh, I think the overall vision, we can mix different steps and different uh, implementations. So you can have a Python, then you have Go, and then you have a Java SDK. We didn't try it yet. It's a very experimental functionality. Uh, but it would be very nice because many of our users like Python. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Anyone else? <laughs> you said that you wrote uh, support for views, right? Yes. Does it support updatable views or? No, it's uh, um, views. like a macro expansion. So it's a macro expanded okay. views, not updatable. Updatable views is a very complicated thing to implement properly. But I'm not sure if Calcite itself supports such views because if it does, we can do it as well. More questions? No, I, let's give uh, Gleb another round of applause then and call from you. Our next speaker is uh, Wilhelm from um, EQT, and he will take you through how they use Beam um, and the project called Mother Brain, which is quite a cool name. I, I hope to learn more about that, uh, which is an AI project at EQT. So welcome, uh, Phil Wilhelm, to the stage. Thank you. I think we need some technical assistance here. <laughs> Up there? What about now? Yeah, there we Yay. go. <laughs> okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Wilhelm von Ernheim. I'm uh, a data engineer at EQT, and uh, I work specifically with a project called uh, Motherbrain. I'm also the host of this meetup, although it haven't been few meetups recently. Uh, I hope uh, we can change that. And it seems like we have a lot of interest here in Stockholm, which is great. And I welcome you all. Um, 
Okay, I thought I'd give a little talk about what we do at DKT at Modbrain and uh, uh, how Beam fits our needs for data processing. Um, to start up, just to give you some kind of context, uh, I thought I'd introduce EKT a bit because not everybody maybe know what we're doing. Uh, EKT is an alternative investment firm uh, that was founded in Stockholm some 25 years ago. And um, uh, we uh, so far have raised uh, approximately 61 billion euros uh, across uh, a couple of funds. And um, we are uh, somewhere over 500 people uh, present in 14 different countries. Uh, and uh, one question you might have is like, okay, what is what are those funds? Well, we invest in companies, so we buy shares in uh, in companies or whole companies, and we keep them for a couple of years, and then we sell them. And uh, um, a typical example of our uh, investors uh, that invest with us are pension funds from uh, uh, some of the world's largest pension funds. Yeah. Um, uh, EGT invests through. Uh, different kinds of investment strategies. Uh, I won't go into details more with that, but uh, some examples are our venture funds that invest, invest in startups. Um, what, uh, an example of investment is Peltarion here in Stockholm that I think a lot of you people probably heard about. Um, uh, another fund called Equity uh, by majority shares in, in larger companies like uh, SUSE Linux or uh, Antisimax. And we also have a, an infrastructure fund that uh, invests in things like data centers and uh, the network providers and, and stuff like that. Um, okay, we have a lot of more funds, but I'm not going to mention them. Uh, but traditionally, as you can imagine, a private equity industry has been quite um, uh, quite traditional. So um, uh, investment firms in general rely on what we call the human intelligence uh, that uh, is essentially to find new companies to invest in. Uh, they have to rely on their network of, uh, of uh, people or maybe go to conferences or if they're lucky, passively just waiting for someone to come and pitch and want to get money from you. Um, and uh, I mean, it's, uh, of course, very hard with this approach to track all companies. Uh, the only way to scale is maybe to get more people to, to help you out. And that's, of course, possible, but it's still gonna, not going to give you get you all the way. Uh, and, uh, but this approach has worked re remarkably well, well for a long time. And uh, most investment firms just still, and uh, it's a nice approach. But uh, the world is changing like drastically. Like, there's data everywhere. and uh, Companies leave the digital footprint pretty much uh, in everything they do. Uh, they uh, show up in social media, in news, or they uh, they uh, are present in uh, app stores and you know you know uh, a lot of different places. Um, so uh, you can be sure that disruption is coming to uh, to uh, the pure human approach in this area, and. Uh, we can now track increasingly uh, more data about companies uh, and train algorithms to find interesting investment opportunities that way instead. So uh, meet Motherbrain. This is our effort, not this, but <laughs> our effort to, uh, to play a part in this disruption. Um, we've invested heavily during the last three years uh, in both our data and AI platform, and we humbly named it Motherbrain. So that's where the name comes from. <laughs> Um, the name is actually uh, a boss in, a, in an old game. I think uh, a lot of you has probably played it. Um, the first problem we sought to solve with Motherbrain was uh, uh, deal sourcing, uh, specifically for the Ventures Fund. So essentially try to find interesting startups that we could invest in. And Motherbrain uh, was actually born as an initiative from a couple of people within Ventures. Uh, as these people uh, used to work in data-driven startups, uh, building products in a data-driven way, and they wanted to do the same within private equity instead. Uh, but finding interesting companies from a venture fund is not easy. Like uh, when we look at the number of unicorns that has been created, we have like 400 unicorns in total uh, out of millions and millions of companies. And thousands of new companies are started every day. So. Uh, of course, there is a, uh, something you need to do uh, to, um, to find the next couple of ones that are going to be created during the next couple of years. But just to prove our thesis, we uh, did a little back testing. 
looking at historical data over nine years or so, uh, and specifically uh, looking at uh, some of the bigger unicorns that, uh, that uh, have already been. Uh, and uh, these are the results we found. It was quite good. Uh, I mean, our models could detect uh, the strong signals quite early on in this the, in the uh, all, all of the cases, and uh, this is very nice. But there are a lot of as other aspects to this problem as well. Of course, you need uh, to um, uh, get access to people working there, and you also need to convince the investment professionals internally that, that this might be a good deal. I mean, even though Airbnb is nice now, maybe it didn't look so nice in 2009 to, for, to an investment professional. Um, and we would do this with data, of course. Uh, we try to uh, gather as much data as possible from a lot of diverse different kinds of sources. So um, uh, it's everything from financial data to web traffic data to uh, you, you, social networks, et cetera. And um, uh, more sources are added every day. Uh, or no, more data is everywhere. <laughs> we try to add as many new sources as possible where it makes sense, um, where we can find interesting signal about a uh, company's digital footprint. And that could be uh, 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 anything like sudden increase in job listings or uh, key people moving uh, to another company or some, something like that. So, uh, uh, of course, our backlog is growing faster than we can uh, maybe uh, keep up with, so, but we treat, try to keep a structured approach of taking in new data sources, uh, validate both their coverage and their quality, and also uh, make sure that we can integrate them in our data model. And uh, speaking of which, like in order to make uh, integration of data uh, as easy as possible, we decided quite early on to reduce uh, all the data sources to a very common like uh, abstraction, a log format that uh, kind of tries to abstract away the differences in the, in the different uh, sources. And um, um, this abstraction makes it possible to keep the sources as decoupled as possible from each other. We don't need to run any huge big joins that kind of collects everything together all the time. We'd rather uh, just uh, let downstream handle about uh, which sources they are interested in for the different applications and so on. And um, uh, we can, th this also makes it easy for us to change, make changes to the data model without actually having to change schemas in all the different parts and all the different uh, data sources that we ingest. Um, and a really important aspect of keeping it, everything as logs is that we're able to not only say what has happened, but also when something happened. And this is very important for us uh, as most of our prediction tasks uh, are kind of temporal. So we want to know like when something is interesting to fund in, uh, to put, put the money into and, and stuff like that. So it's very important that we, when we train our models, look at how the data looked at that specific time. And obviously we use Beam for the processing. <laughs> um, here's a simple, uh, whoops, the Beam logo happened to move since we moved over here. But uh, um, uh, this is a simplification of our infrastructure looks, looks like. We have a lot of different data sources that we try to that we are ingesting, and uh, each of these get uh, a uh, each separate pipeline that do cleaning. I realize that it's really hard to read for you, maybe, uh, but normalization, match, matching to uh, against other sources, and uh, deduplication, and so on. And then it kind of ends up in this log format where we keep logs on an attribute level for each of the different uh, uh, kind of. Uh, yeah, attributes. And um, uh, then later on, we kind of put all that into uh, uh, Kafka, which is also behind here somewhere. <laughs> and, uh, and then the downstream consumers like uh, BigQuery, Redis, and Elasticsearch can kind of uh, uh, pick and choose between the data in those log formats. And uh, uh, we built model brain using modern infrastructure that um, enables us to uh, to uh, process a lot of data. So Beam uh, plays a very central role there, doing a lot of the processing and then maybe uh, letting other tools do the serving or whatever do they, they do best. Uh, this helped us keep focus on building uh, things that differentiate us and, uh, and create value rather than uh, uh, 
Uh, yeah, and uh, using the best of breed open source technologies has given us access uh, to a lot of talented people and also uh, knowledge from the community. So I think it, it's been a great uh, choice for us to use use Beam here. Um, we also like uh, since we're such a small team, especially when we started out, uh, uh, it made sense for us to run as much as possible on managed services. Uh, we decided to go with GCP quite early on. And then uh, um, it was a natural conclusion for us to try to run on Dataflow uh, 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 as well there. And um, um, we still use Beam uh, on Dataflow as our main processing framework, uh, and it works really well for us. Um, one small annoyance that I might kind of add here is that when you have a lot of data, it works really well. But for smaller pipelines, it's really hard. If you have a lot of small streaming pipelines, you get dedicated workers for each of those, which is maybe not uh, great if the data that comes through is not super rapid. Um, so we'll see where that goes. Um, the first observation I must uh, make that I think that uh, Beam has a very intuitive programming model that is easy to work with. Uh, the idea uh, of a pipeline is, of course, not super new, but uh, combining that with windowing and uh, event time and triggers, it makes it uh, very easy to reason about your transformations and uh, and your stream processing. And um, um, we've had uh, engineers with very little to no experience with data engineering implement clean and efficient pipelines without much guidance. And I think that's uh, that's super cool. Um, of course, uh, when you start making more complex pipelines, you uh, uh, need to dig deeper into the framework, but I think uh, a lot of it still holds, and it's uh, very intuitive and gets, uh, and still very powerful when you need it to, need it to be. Um, another thing that I think is very refreshing is how Beam handles uh, the streaming versus batch like differences. Uh, instead of letting the processing engine itself to kind of define which uh, we're dealing with. We instead put that on the uh, input uh, data or input sources uh, and let those decide for you. So a static file would definitely be a batch input. Kafka would be a streaming input. Uh, but you can also have variations of the two. You can have like a, a pattern that is uh, continuously reading files in a streaming fashion, or you can just read everything from uh, beginning to, to the current offset in Kafka and, and be done with it. Um, uh, and uh, the way uh, we also can uh, can kind of do event time windowing makes it a lot of easier for us to reason about uh, streaming in the way that you normally would do with uh, batch processing. And I say uh, coming from uh, using the Lambda architecture before, uh, I think uh, this is a really refreshing, nice way to get both uh, fresh data and uh, and uh, large uh, batch processing jobs in the same engine. Um, another aspect that I think has been really nice for us is the isolation of complexity uh, by using pipelines. So since we have so many different data sources and uh, uh, a, a lot of different kinds of models and stuff that are running, it's easy to isolate them and uh, kind of limit interdependencies as much as possible. So uh, the larger our infrastructure gets and, uh, uh, and the more data and models we get, of course, we get a more complex system. But uh, the, keeping this in pipelines in, in the Beam model has really helped us getting it more modular and focused on, uh, on uh, load, load on dependencies. Um, and but one of the things that I think uh, is, uh, is the best with Beam is really that it's super easy like similar to what you were asking me before, it's super easy to uh, to get data into uh, Beam. The I/O modules are extremely flexible. There are a ton of them. Uh, you can follow the link down at the end, at the bottom there, if you want to see all of them that are currently uh, uh, in production uh, or in master. And um, but but you can see like reading Avro, continuously reading new files, or uh, writing it to a partition table in BigQuery. It doesn't have to be that many lines of code, and you, but you could still do a lot of different uh, kind of things with it. And uh, uh, that is something that I, th I think is really nice. For us, that we have a lot of different, um, we're such a small shop, but still we have a lot of different tools. And I think it's super convenient for us to be able to do this in a flexible way. Um, IO is not only flexible, it's also composable, which I think is something that is very refreshing. 
um, you can uh, compose the, the sources and sinks are not considered like uh, it is in many other kind of processing frameworks. It doesn't necessarily have to be on the ends of the pipeline. So they're more uh, handled like normal transformations. So you could start by reading like uh, file names from a Kafka log and then uh, do uh, uh, like a file I read and parsing of the, those files continuously as you move along. And I think that's a, that's a really cool cool way to handle I.O. It's possible to do very, very powerful things using this. Um, uh, since they're processed uh, as, uh, as uh, normal transforms and not some kind of uh, specific uh, sharding or, or uh, something like that, uh, it's uh, a lot easier for the engines also to, to uh, uh, execute this in parallel where it's possible. So you can still get a lot of uh, uh, performance gains uh, and get the data in uh, in a in a distributed manner, but uh, uh, but uh, yeah, which is really nice. Of course, uh, we're actually using both Python and Java, um, and uh, for our pipelines, I think uh, uh, mostly because it makes sense to use them for different things. The Python SDK is great for uh, doing a lot of ML stuff. Like uh, uh, was mentioned before, did like TFX or uh, that is using Python, but also uh, if you want to run like uh, TensorFlow models that the, or uh, or Scikit-Learn models or something like that. Since there is such a rich uh, ecosystem around Python, I think it's uh, nice to have that available uh, in in uh, in Beam. Uh, that being said, Python uh, has uh, been only Python two, which has been kind of Painful for us a bit, at least most I must say, and uh, uh, the it only ran on Dataflow, uh, which we of course only were only using, but I see that as definitely as a, as a drawback, and uh, it's not as mature as, as Java, so you don't have as many I/O connectors and stuff. Although that is rapidly changing, Python three um, uh, support is coming uh, like pretty much any time now, and uh, um, uh, you also see the portability, portability initiative that enables you to run. Python pipelines uh, and cross-language pipelines in uh, um, other runners as well, like Flink or, or, or Spark. Uh, sadly, Robert will not come here and talk about portability now, but yeah, next time maybe. Um, but uh, for Java, has been uh, a lot easier for us to, to kind of keep robust. Like you get a lot of uh, extra having static typing and stuff like that, and so it's easier to catch errors early on. and. Uh, and uh, it's a lot more feature complete, where you have uh, a lot more features that are uh, super interesting uh, and uh, useful. Uh, one of those that I thought might be worth mentioning is the state and timers. Um, I think uh, it's kind of a cool uh, thing that you can do, like where you have a, a state that you can save as long as it's kind of uh, um, serializable. Uh, uh, but also a timer that you can kind of uh, trigger and then and then flush your uh, your results. And um, um, we use this in a, in a few different places, uh, especially where it doesn't make sense to use normal combined uh, functions for aggregations. Maybe that's because you have a compl more complex model object, or you have uh, um, something that is not mergeable. Then I find it easier to, to use this this approach. Uh, another example that we use the timers for is uh, when you do external HTTP requests. Instead of uh, like having each worker being blocked by uh, the request, you can do it asynchronously and then collect the results when the timer uh, expires instead. And that's, uh, that's kind of cool to be able to do inside a, uh, uh, a streaming or, or batch pipeline, I think. Um, we also use it for buffering. Uh, Maybe uh, so some of the things that we do get, get kind of, uh, <laughs> there tends to be a lot of messages that are pushed downstream and maybe just overwriting each other. Then it's easier to kind of do some kind of buffering and then for a specific amount of time and then, uh, and then uh, flush that downstream uh, when, when, it, when it's, yeah, in a certain specific intervals. Um, to conclude, uh, Beam really makes it easy for us to focus on what matters which is essentially giving uh, uh, superpowers to our investment professionals. Uh, 
uh, the intuitive model possibility to run as a managed service, uh, the flexible IO transforms and uh, how easy it's combined both batch and streaming uh, makes Beam a great fit for us. Thank you. So maybe questions. Uh, notice from the logos that you seem to be using Kafka. Yes. Uh, uh, is the reason why you went with Kafka instead of GCP's PubSub? Yeah, I think uh, the possibility to replay and not necessarily be uh, kind of uh, required to be a consumer uh, when the messages comes into PubSub, I think uh, that, that makes it a lot more flexible. So we a lot of our smaller kind of uh, databases and stuff that consume data from Kafka, uh, can kind of uh, re-index without anything else being part of it. Whereas if it would have been in PubSub and we want to like read all the data back into the Elastic uh, index, then uh, uh, we need to force it to start again in some way and that would affect other consumers as well. That was the reason anyway. Uh, I'm not sure if that was the correct reason, but yeah. More questions? Cool. Uh, another round of applause for Willem, then, please. Thank you. So, a few last words from me. Um, these slides will be become available, including Robert's slides from the last meetup in uh, London. So, you'll be able to learn about portability, at least, paired with the uh, recording. That should be quite nice already. But we'll get him here um, one of the next few months, hopefully. Um, and then some other good news. There is still some time to get some beer, some maybe more pizza. I'm not sure if there's more pizza. But um, make your way over there and um, mingle a bit, talk to some people, and enjoy. Thank you for coming. There's stickers. There's stickers and there's flashlights for people that are really fast <laughs> or sitting in the front rows, probably. <laughs>